Hello everyone and welcome to OKCoin OK Live today with Alex and Harrison, a new co-host that we have from the listings team. And so before we dive in, we have a very special episode today. Uh, we have Stuart from Kadena and uh, with us, and we'll talk a lot about the protocol. But first, man, oh man, oh man, do we need to talk about the markets and what the heck is happening? Because phew, the last week especially has been a bloodbath. You're hurting, we're hurting, everyone's hurting, so let's hurt together and try to figure, make sense out of all of this. Especially let's talk about DeFi, because with Celsius now uh, either insolvent or liquid, whichever one they are, we're not sure, maybe both, um, with Luna going down and taking Celsius with it, it looks like. You know, there's definitely blood in the streets, there's definitely fear. And so if there's any time to just calm the nerves, understand what's what's happened to crypto, I'm starting to get a lot of in my circles as crypto dead messages, <laughs> even from people that were degening in, you know, all the crazy, uh, they went deep, deep down the degen protocol and uh, yield, yield farming protocols. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to welcome Stuart. Stuart, can you give us just a quick intro? Welcome to OKCoin OK Live. So happy to have you. Give us a quick intro. We're going to jump in. Lots of things to talk about. Sure. Thanks for having me. My name is Stuart Popejoy. I'm the CEO of Kadena. Uh, Kadena is the is the only scalable uh, proof of work blockchain that's really the best blockchain for builders. And my background is uh, I've been in technology for almost 30 years. Um, kind of the main part of what I was doing before I got into blockchain was um, working on exchange and trading software. Uh, eventually, that brought me to JP Morgan uh, to work on. And then uh, there I ended up working uh, forming their blockchain research and strategic investment group. And that's the context from which uh, Kadena was launched was um, because there we really had a chance to talk to everybody in blockchain circa 2015 and really figure out what exactly the industry needed to really get to adoption and really be able to move forward. And in fact, not much has changed since then in terms of some of the problems we saw then. And that's exactly why we founded Kadena. Um, Kadena also has, uh, I'm the author of PACT, the smart contract language in Kadena, which is distinguished itself by being um, really easy to learn, easy to read, and um, safe by default. Um, there's a whole, we have a site called Saved by Kadena. Saved by Kadena that is, um, that shows how a bunch of like huge hacks like literally couldn't happen if, if you had used the PACT smart, uh, PAC smart contract language. So that's a little about me and a little about Kadena. Awesome. Uh, well, let me ask you, let me just jump in. One of the things I know you were doing in your previous life at JP Morgan, especially was you were the head of algorithmic trading. And so let's, let, let's talk a little bit about that because the holy grail for stable coins, let's talk a little bit about Luna. We'll take you away from Kadena and go into Luna is algorithmic stables, right? Government resistant. You're not buying treasuries. You're not rolling anything. You're not buying commercial paper. You're not buying corporate paper. You're creating uh a virtual cycle loop or a fixed loop between some sort of proxy, right? And the stable coin in Luna's case, it was a Luna token and they caught a death spiral, right? And so let's talk about, is it even possible to have an algorithmic stable coin that's not backed by, let's say a dollar pegged stable coin that's not backed by any US or corporate commercial paper? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, I think there's a lot of eyes, eyes on Maker right now, um, just in the sense that um, while I think Maker had some systemic threats uh, at various times, um, one of the things they've really focused on is diversification. Um, so uh, now the question is whether or not um, cryptos are just as a class too unstable to really collateralize something like a stable coin. But I think at least, you know, I think maker probably represents kind of, you know, I, I would suggest that's best in class at this point, just in terms of potential stability. However, it has been argued that even maker, uh, you know, when, when the going got rough, you had people not dumping because they believed in maker. Um, you know, and, and that's, of course, you can't, you know, you can't conclude that firmly. But there are certainly situations when ETH was shaky and, and that, 
you know, you could have had the kind of run that certainly led to the Terra debacle. Uh, I'm, I'm of the belief that that was, you know, some kind of big short squeeze. Um, with, with the Luna depegging? Yeah. Using Bitcoin. Um, that's my belief, you know, but that's, again, that's scuttlebutt, you know, there, it's hard, it's hard, you know, any, anything that involves like shorting Bitcoin, you know, is not happening on chain. So you're, you're not going to be able to find like a smoking gun there. I think Celsius is a little more interesting because I actually, my understanding is that there's, you know, that the Lido staked ETH is a big issue with Celsius. And actually that I think, um, is an interesting case where you have what, you know, previously was as you know kind of rock solid proof of work coin ethereum like bitcoin like cadena um that there's instability being introduced into it because so much ethereum is being put towards staked eth um so that's not again this isn't a this this is a little you know, like it, this would be something where Celsius, I think, could be, you know, maybe they don't want to say something right now because they're right in the middle of it, but it'll be very welcome for Celsius to be a little more transparent about what's going on. It's not my feeling is their situation is probably some kind of temporal insolvency. One hopes one hopes it's temporal insolvency and therefore it should be something that they can be candid about. Uh, I think the terror situation is entirely different. Yeah, I know, Harrison, I know you have a question. Let me just ask one more because this is, I do want to come back to algorithmic stable coins and, and, and Terra, but <clears throat> what I'm, I wanted to ask about proof of stake and proof of work, and this is, <clears throat> there are a lot of narratives about ESG and Bitcoin um, and proof of work in general, and people trying to knock proof of work chains. And everybody's going to proof of stake chains because proof of stake is better environmentally, blah, 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 blah. And you guys are actually pretty environmentally friendly and are proof of work. But I think, you know, uh, and I do want to touch upon Cadena, but let's just talk at a high level because I think that, you know, <laughs> I read this amazing meme. It said that, you know, bear markets make and make like degens into Bitcoin maxis. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and it's true because it's all nice and fun when, you know, you're degening into like, uh, you know, ship Elon rocket ship moon coin. Uh, and it's no longer nice and fun when the market just takes takes a hit, when NFTs take a hit, when there's an actual insolvency, and when when the, the cream rise, you know, gets separated from 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 everything else. And so, proof of work chains are fundamentally different proof of stake. Can you talk a little bit about that? And actually, let's go a little bit a level or two deeper than the risks or the obfuscated risks. In this case, we see one that proof of stake chains introduce, right? Due to the actual staking mechanism, due to removing people miss, I think people overlook what it is to be a liquid market, right? Is it tradable? And what it is to be a deep market, right? Where you actually have volume to trade into. And all this is very, is, is, is all involved, especially when it comes to proof of stake chains and when things are staked. Uh, so can we can we talk a little bit about that proof of work versus proof of stake? What are some of the underlying hidden risks in proof of stake chains that when people are looking to invest in different uh, protocols and need to understand? Well, the simplest one is, of course, that the security directly comes uh, at the cost of liquidity in a proof of stake system. Um, you know, and that can be, you know, you can come up, it's, it's, it does relate to the discussion about algorithmic stable coins, because you can try to do any sort of financial engineering, uh, you want to, and indeed chains do extremely different things, uh, regarding this. And that's actually another thing that makes proof of stake complicated is that pretty much, you know, every, every kind of proof of stake chain is different and they're almost, they almost have nothing in common, um, beyond the fact that they have this kind of core fundamental mechanism of staking, staking crypto to provide security. Um, so the first thing to say is that proof of work, you know, it's derided for, uh, in, in the case of Bitcoin, you know, it's derided for the fact that so much energy goes into it. But of course, the fact that there is a both an energy investment and a hardware investment into that make that is what allows people to participate in mining. 
that is something that while certainly can be affected by the price, you know, the dynamics of that can be affected by the price of the, of the protocol coin. Um, it behaves a little bit more like a commodity in the sense that, you know, oil gets affected by the price of oil, you know, like, um, there's an old saying in the oil world, which is, uh, the best cure for high oil prices is high oil prices. Um, just because <laughs> people stop buying gas. So like you see similar things happen in proof of work, you know, if the price goes down, people start, uh, you know, unloading their mining hardware. Um, but the point is, is that those, uh, those kind of, uh, headwinds or whatever, operate in the realm of kind of commodity production and they really have nothing to do with whatever so in the case of ethereum it would have nothing to do with whatever DeFi kind of stuff is going on on ethereum um and a proof of stake system on the other hand uh well first there's the fundamental uh, challenge to liquidity <clears throat> that comes from needing to stake a significant amount of economic uh, you know, a, a significant percentage of the liquidity of the coin to provide security. And so then you have to ask the question, you know, like we, I just discussed how proof of work could potentially impact, you know, how a dropping price in proof of work can potentially impact security. It's a direct impact on a security for a proof of stake, because as the real world price of that uh, coin plummets, uh, you find yourself in a situation where things can uh, really get out of hand uh, in, a, in a kind of runaway fashion. But the final thing I want to say is that one of the th is that is a little more um, what's the word? It's a little more social or in the sense of like, what is the common practice? So it's not really a common practice. And now there's so few proof of work coins anymore that I mean, proof of work used to be a much richer field back in like 2015 and 2016. And people were trying to kind of do different things with proof of work. But generally speaking, nobody in proof of work is ever going to do something to kind of involve the platform coin in some kind of um, enterprise that happens in a smart contract on chain that just whereas like in proof of stake, this is very common. You have, well, of course, Terra. And that was the big thing that really wrecked Terra was the fact that the issuance of the proof of stake coin was directly tied to a financial product on platform. But we see this, uh, you know, ThorChain, um, you know, this is something that is not uncommon, in fact, with proof of stake, because there's no kind of, uh, because you're already doing this kind of financial manipulation with the coin to provide security, it's kind of a natural leap to say, hey, well, now we got all these stake coins, it's a bunch of trap liquidity, why don't we do something else with it? Why don't we peg it? Why don't we like, you know, offer some kind of derivative based off of it? So um, you see this kind of building up of systemic instability within a chain. And that's just something that simply does not, it's not that it couldn't happen on proof of work, it's that it never would, because nobody, nobody in a proof of work network is, is interested. The coin is already doing its job. It's already providing this, it's already, it's not even providing the security, it's rewarding people for providing, providing the security. So it's really a fundamentally different scenario. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, and just to add to that, I think it's interesting, um, even though Ethereum still is proof of work today, the financialization of having a staked ETH uh, lending product or staking product via Celsius or via Lido has created these, um, these leverage risks in the system. And although there might not be the same probability or even any probability of ETH going to zero because of a, a broken peg of ETH to ETH, um, I do think they're there and we're seeing it today. It increases the short term volatility um, as we lead up to the merge. So what you're saying is, is true on proof of work chains, too, but uh, with less of the, the risk to zero. Well, but I, I again, that's I think. Yeah, you're right. I mean, in the sense that somebody could introduce I mean, stake ETH at this point in time is just stake is just basically a pool. So in that right. sense, it's not, you know, it's, it's not ETH. Um, all, so it's not it. Well, you're right also that it's not. And I think it's not threatening the security of Ethereum right now. Too like Ethereum right. is e ETH 1.0 is humming along. It, it, none of this is going to remotely impact its operation. ETH 2.0. Harder to say.
Yeah. Yeah. And, and one other thing I'd love to get your view on too. Um, it's become more clear recently that, that Do Kwan was voting on behalf of, he had private wallets that had significant allocations of Luna and was voting on behalf of uh, the proposals that he created um, in favor of those proposals. And I think a lot of people talk about proof of stake being like a, a democratized way of uh, moving a blockchain forward. But then you also see these conflicts of interest happen too, where something that's supposed to be decentralized isn't actually decentralized. Whereas proof of work gives everyone a theoretically fair shot at, at um, getting their opinions heard. So it, I guess I'd just like to hear your thoughts on, on that, um, the comparisons of proof of stake and proof of work a little bit further here. From a governance kind of perspective. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, so proof of work, you know, at, and again, there's lots of different scenarios with proof of work. And generally speaking, a, a young proof of work network is a very risky place. Um, launching proof of work is tricky. Um, and, you know, and, and you kind of, there's a kind of, oh, there's a kind of a point, there's a, there's a hockey stick kind of thing where like, once you get to a particular point, your security starts to rise. And it usually has to do with kind of like fundamental profitability of the uh, of the token reaching some kind of minimum relative to the cost of mining and relative to the availability of mining hardware and things like that. So fortunately, Kadena got past that. That took about a year and a half. Um, and Ethereum and uh, and then of course Bitcoin is you know a ridiculous amount, way too much security. Um, and but, you know, one thing that we, you know, when you run a proof of work network that you live and breathe is the fact that, you know, it's really uh, is that it's really it's not your network, you know, and proof of stake is a little bit different because while certainly you could in a proof of work network um, try to launch with a bunch of mining hardware and try to dominate that hardware and only hand it out to investors, it's almost impossible. Whereas uh, proof of stake, it is the default launch the default launch is insiders and then it starts sprinkling out to everybody else over time but without it without insiders having to let go of any of their position really at all and it working as in a kind of deflationary mechanism especially as it uh, relates to people who come in later um so again we're in a situation where proof of work isn't you know it's kind of like once it, it its risk is all kind of front loaded and then once that stuff is is kind of up and running and rolling like i think new proof of work projects are risky but once they're up and running they become very stable um but Stuart, quick question wouldn't you say the same thing about proof of stake if it's a young proof of stake chain you can buy your your way in if you call it call it an a hundred thousand dollar call it a million dollar chain okay total chain total total diluted cap you buy five hundred thousand and one dollars worth of the token isn't it the same effectively the same thing well one thing is different chains are different of course um in terms of like some chains have limits on you know how big the kind of like validator set can be and how the valid you know like there's uh, breaks on how quickly the validator set can change um so it varies from chain to chain um, you know, and I do think some proof of stake chains are, you know, are, you know, kind of more bedrock than others, like generally Tendermint and Cosmos and the way a lot of Cosmos chains roll out, uh, or Tezos, you know, like there's a lot of chains that just really, you know, don't really mess with that very much. Um, you mean so, have, have better security? Well, see, that's the problem is that actually there's a lot of curation that has to, the problem is, is that the insiders really get to decide what happens in a proof of stake system. It's really no different. Proof of stake really, res one of the reasons why proof of stake is kind of spiritually aligned with DeFi is that so much of what goes on in proof of stake is almost identical to what goes on in like a comp protocol. Um, in the sense that, you know, you're doing staking, collateralization, governance, have a tendency to have kind of, and so the whole, one of the problems you face when you're trying to design a comp or when you're trying to launch a proof of stake network is how do you kind of avoid uh, creating pockets of centralization in the, in the kind of ownership mix. And it's incredibly hard to do because 
all of the forces want to go in the other direction. All your whales, VCs, everybody who's coming in at the beginning want the biggest thing you can give them. And if you don't give them very much, they're not interested. So you're going to be fighting your investors right from the start and plenty of projects do the opposite. They like, and why, and who can blame them, right? I mean, they've got all this money coming in. What are you going to do? Say no to everybody. So instead it's quite the opposite. Those people come in and they're huge validators and, and they can make, don't forget, they can maintain that position because they've, you know, if, if things are going up, then they're probably going to double down and increase their position as well. And what's more, they're making their, their velocity, their momentum is greater than anybody else in the project. So they can stay ahead of people, you know, and that's true of anybody who has more, more uh, of the token than someone else. So, so it's not impossible, but it's very challenging. And you're, and you basically have headwinds that um, are extremely powerful because they're oftentimes the people that you're trying to please the most, which are your big investors. Um, the last thing, of course, is that um, I think one of the interesting things about proof of work with governance is just the fact that um, the fact that there's a, a physical layout, you know, that there's kind of a, you know, that you have to establish a physical presence means that um, it's, it's both harder and easier to become a, but the point is, is that nobody, the only thing that's stopping you from becoming like a significant miner is money and deployment. Whereas in um, the thing about, and that's something that it doesn't really matter. You don't really have to go around and find out wh who, which miner is which. Whereas on a proof of stake system, it's all happening on chain. It's all about these private, these public keys. And the fact of the matter is that there's just fundamentally no way to tell one public key apart from another and know whether or not they're the same person. I mean, this is what comp has to deal with. This is what, you know, uh, a security system like the Tezos rolls model, you know, like that's why sometimes you make very big, that's why Ethereum had such big initial deployments is that you want to make it hard for somebody to come in with a bunch of rolls. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a fundamental challenge in the system that they're always dealing with. And, and Stuart, for our listeners that may not know what a comp protocol is, can you explain that quickly? <laughs> I'm very much not an expert on comp. <laughs> um, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, comp was based, it's a lot of DeFi projects have some kind of governance component. Oh, you're referring to compound. Oh, sorry. Yeah, compound. Oh, okay. Okay. That, I also did refer you still to explain token. It? Yeah, I mean, Compound is is a lending protocol where the lending amounts are determined by governance. So, um, and there's much more to Comp than that. But I mean, just in terms of our immediate discussion, it has the same kind of thing. It has a token, it has the Comp token, and that Comp token is involved in governance. And Comp is an example where the Comp token was also the reward for lending, and that's why you had the yield farm explosion, which, by the way, was terrible for governance. It was great for Comp. It was great for Compound. I mean, it's why Compound went through the roof. But it was it was sad. And I think even, you know, I, you can't feel too sorry for Compound given how rich they got. But I, 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 I and I don't know them personally, but I but, you know, I think that there was some wistfulness about the fact that the, the, the kind of yield farming um, exponential thing that happened with the comp token really destroyed what was a very tightly formed governance. And, and this it gets back to the same thing that like once you start leveraging and, and coming up with kind of these uh, leveraged financial products in a governance context that does not mix well. well that isn't that that's the other knock on proof of stake is that ultimately it's compounded interest, not to use compound in this case, it's, it's a coincidence. But yeah, but the more you put in, the more you get back, the more you put in, the more you get back. And over time, even if everything is not is not nefarious, and even if the government is, is you're listening to everyone and you're somehow an angel and you're not you know, um, uh, angling towards your uh, original investors, over time, the whales become much more powerful, much, much richer. And over time, it does centralize itself. And I think we've covered this on a different episode uh, before, but um, it's, it's, you know, it's very important. And, and it, it kind of kills me when we hear regulators in the spirit of defending the, you know, the everyday Joe and in the, in the spirit of ESG, start knocking proof of work blockchains or creating these blanket proof of work um, uh, laws, right? Or, or regulations. 
without fully understanding the trade-offs between proof of stake and proof of work, just because one sounds like it's more ESG friendly. It's just completely short-term thinking. And as we think about this industry, um, and actually here's the next kind of question for you is, look, you know, we have an exposure of layer ones, but there has to be a consolidation at some point. We're going to live in a multi-chain world, but you know, not every chain is going to survive. Not every L1 is going to survive. And when we have a consolidation on one L1, uh, let's take one where, you know, potentially a very wealthy uh, owner of an exchange has a lot of stake in. Um, let's just create a hypothetical example like that. Let's call it Mulana. And, and let's say this chain becomes bigger and bigger and bigger uh, over time and more and more used. You know, you're going to have centralization there. So do you believe in a world where you're going to have consol a consolidation of layer ones? Like, what does the future look like in five, 10 years? Uh, is it going to be kind of like the stack that we have now where people, you know, we had IRC before and we've settled on different internet protocols. We've settled on a few. We're building up now. Is it going to be the same thing or is the value going to still accrue down to the base layer? Um. I think I think there well one is that proof of stake is this ongoing experiment and they are very different. You know, Avalanche is very different from ETH2O is very different from Tezos is very different from uh you know Cosmos uh Tendermint. So um you know so that was like uh and you know and and with a great deal of success. I'm not I'm not knocking proof of stake as some kind of impossibility, but I'm but um but the other thing to realize is that, you know, that Bitcoin being, I, I think people really, when, when, when the big move to proof of stake happened, I think people really thought Bitcoin was either going to drop in value or actually just get completely like someone was just going to take that ledger and put it on a proof of stake chain, you know, cause that, that was when Bitcoin cash was launching. That's when like, you know, a bunch of like forks of Bitcoin were happening. And I think there was this belief at one time that it's not the protocol, it's it's the it's the token. You know, it's it, it's the ledger, not the protocol. You know, it's the ownership, not not how it's managed or governance. And Bitcoin basically proved all of that wrong by becoming the blue chip, um, uh, you know, the premier crypto. And so I think that's a lesson to look at for the future: is that you can't underestimate Bitcoin. Period. Like you can't assume that like any of the stuff that's happening right now is going to take Bitcoin out. I think you'd be very wise to bet against Bitcoin in the long term. Um, so that means we're going to be in a multi L1 world for a minute because, um, you know, you have Cadena who is like, yeah, and, and we can talk a little later about what Cadena is doing to like address the concerns about proof of work that are leading people to ban it. Like Cadena has an answer on, you know, on, in multiple dimensions for what proof of work in the future should look like. But, um, you know, but then meanwhile, we have the other chains that are, you know, doing their different things. And um, I think proof of stake uh, chains are going to shake out um, because one, of, obviously one of the big problems with blockchain right now is scalability and dealing with layer two versus layer one. And that story is not written yet. It's not even clear what's going to be the dominant layer two solution. So that's why I think a lot of people like to say crypto is still early, even though it's, you know, it's been a while now, um, is that um, is, is that some, you know, that thing that like, oh, aren't we going to standardize on our protocols soon? Like, you know, like I think after like 10 or 12 years of like earnest in earnest, I think a lot of Internet protocols kind of settled down. So we're actually kind of late for that consolidation if we look to TCP IP as our metaphor. But. Um, I think that shows that that metaphor is getting pretty tired because, you know, we're talking about governance and economic protocols. Those are, those involve humans and human, you know, that's like talking about how long it took for modern democracy to emerge. I mean, that's like hundreds of years. So like, or, you know, for monarchies to mutate and things like that. So like, I think the human element is what makes this stuff move a great deal slower and um so i think we're in you know like we're, we're in a shakeout right now uh we're probably gonna have a few more of these and um and and then we're gonna like and i think it the next round of DeFi is what's going to be really interesting because you know 
really were, you know, when people say is crypto dead right now, I think it's not dead isn't the right term. The term it, basically the the pair, you know, the kind of free for all we've been in for the for the past three plus years, four years. You know, it was first fueled by ICOs, but then it, I think it was really fueled by DeFi and the uh -huh. explosion of protocols and the explosion of value. And so that is what is having a massive course correction right now, is that thing that really took Bitcoin from 10,000 to 50,000 to 60,000 is really DeFi making the, you know, bringing so all of a sudden there's just a huge number of protocols huge, you know, all this like easy money, tons of money coming in. And, you know, and then of course there's other macroeconomic things to discuss why so much money came into crypto. So it's not just DeFi, but DeFi, I think, brought in the asset pool. So it seemed like they could absorb all this inbound investment at a time. Well, in this kind of ongoing crisis we're having on the macro level of like no good place to put your money. So, and what, and that's another cycle that is just now starting to end with inflation. So, you know, we are in kind of a double crunch right now. And, and so we should uh, spend some time on Cadena here shortly, but I do want to kind of round out this proof of stake discussion um, with the, the merge scheduled to, to go live here soon for ETH 2.0. Do you think soon. that, yeah, we'll just pretend like it's going to go live. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just um for the purposes of this conversation it's going live for the purposes so, of my celsius holdings please go live <laughs> i'll lock i'll lock me celsius mashinsky if you're listening come to the show and i'll lock my holdings <laughs> uh alex needs a bailout he's a whale he needs a bailout um so <laughs> going back to to what i was saying though so it's since given the way that ethereum launched and like has been around for nine years now. Um, I think it's been nine years uh, without any 2013, right? Yeah. 2015. Oh, no, it was like 2015, the proper launch. Dang. Just give um, it two more years. At, 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 at year nine, it will definitely be 2.0. We're going to do this. It, it's it'll funny because in 2014, everybody was talking about Ethereum. So it's kind of hard to remember exactly when the launch was because there's so much focus on Ethereum when it was in testnet and leading up to launch. That it was kind of like, oh, wait, so it actually launched now? Or is it in pre mine? Like, it was, you know. We're going to have a coming out party. We're going to have an ETH 2.0 plus Cardano working smart contracts coming out party. And this is going to happen whenever. <laughs> All right. I'm coming. Yeah. And, and my, uh, just for everyone listening here, my priorities were much different in 2013. I was uh, a sophomore in college. So um, wasn't really focused, about, focused on blockchain technology at the time. Uh, but anyways, given given the way that Ethereum launched, like being proof of work um, for so long and, and being so successful for so long, do you think that it gives it a, a better shot at decentralization once it does merge um, compared to all of these other proof of stake blockchains that have kind of that that kind of started that way? I mean, the problem is, is that it changes. I mean, they just completely changed. Every two years, they change their consensus. Like in a big way, like, and so we're now in like stage four, you know, the fourth kind of like, uh, you know, two year announcement of like, oh, now we're doing, you know, this roll up based blah, blah, blah. Like, so, uh, you know, so I can't, I really don't know what, it's very hard to keep track of exactly what they're thinking in terms of actually how this network will work, actually what like one node does and what another node does. Um, you know, actually like, you know, the whole roll up based thing, like, you know, roll ups have their own kind of liquidity problems. And, you know, and so what do roll ups mean when now that's how the chain works, you're going to like bring L2 into the actual operation of the chain, you know, like there's, they're, they're not being conservative at all. And like, that is weird just because, you know, Ethereum itself was, I think fairly aggressive, but it still used proof of work and, you know, and had obvious kind of ties to Bitcoin in terms of using a byte code and all, all sorts of other things. So, but in general, I think you're right. I, in general, like, um, you know, like 
one thing that might end up being, you know, the blockchain, the way you launch a blockchain is that it might be that you launch it with proof of work and then you eventually migrate to some other consensus like proof of stake once, once distribution has kind of, you know, because proof of work is just excellent at, at distribution. It's a very, it's the fairest distribution model there is. So, and, and you're, and you're right that Ethereum has benefited from that, um, except for the size of their pre-mine, of course, which they don't talk about very much, but, um, Ethereum is actually, you know, in terms of money, but not in terms of mining, in terms of mining, you know, it's, it's pretty, and, and it, it has done its job. It, you know, it, it did distribute, it put ETH into many, many people's hands. And so, yeah, going into a, there's a lot, there's a many, many people who could, who could come into an ETH role or whatever they call that original 35,000 ETH position. Many, many people who could do that. So, um, yeah, so they, you know, they're certainly starting from, there's nobody else starting like that. That's true. Understood. Yeah. Should we, Harrison, I know you love Kanina. Harrison's been shilling Kanina all up and down OK Coin. Uh, loves you guys. So maybe we should ask, I'll, I'll let Harrison take away all the Kadena questions here uh, and ask you, Stuart, because uh, we definitely want to learn a little bit more about the project, given what we talked about, given the stake versus work, uh, given uh, the fact that you're safe with Kadena. So Harrison, this is, this is your time. This is your time to express the love that you've always had. Yeah, full disclosure, I have zero Kadena, unfortunately, or fortunately. Over the past couple of months, it's been rough, but um, so none of what I, I say going forward is financial advice. Um, but I do, I do, none actually, of this is financial advice, all of this is not financial advice. Yes, <laughs> good clarification, Alex. Um, so I do have one question I think, uh, that's kind of macro related that I think segues well into a discussion around Kadena. Um, I think a lot of the reasons why. Uh, people always talk about the institutional adoption needs to take place for us to get to the next leg of, of like higher prices, new all time highs in crypto. Um, and now with yields so low in, you know, in DeFi protocols today, um, I don't really know where this next batch of money is going to come from, where this next uh, group of adoption, uh, who, who those people will be. And Stuart, I'm curious what your thoughts are there. Like, what do, what do you think needs to take place to get us to that next level of adoption? Uh, it doesn't seem like DeFi yields will will uh, take the cake there anymore. So, well, again, I think this is a correction. I think it would be too soon to say DeFi is dead. Um, you know, because let's face it, everybody knows that you know, ninety five percent, maybe not by volume, but certainly by just project count. 95% of DeFi projects were scams or, you know, just really naked Ponzi's. Um, and so, you know, and then, if, you know, and, and those did their thing and ripped off their users and whatever. And like, that's not where the value is. The value is in the protocols that really, you know, the protocols that offered something better. Um, so, but, you know, even that, even the good, you know, like Terra was one of the good ones, right? I mean, so like, you know, so I think uh, the, this is a correction that was a long time coming. And um, I think that there's still, I'm still bullish on the fundamental, like, you know, like I'm very critical of Ethereum. There's lots of things that Kadena does that really like does what Ethereum really should have done. Um, but you cannot deny that Ethereum brought us, you know, brought smart contracts to the mainstream and brought us this, um, the most exciting thing I think about what, what builders can build on a smart contract blockchain like Kadena is the way that you can take the community that surrounds a layer one like Bitcoin or Ethereum or Kadena and have it surround an economic protocol. And that is not dead. I don't think it's ever going to die. And I think that is the thing that that crypto really brought to the world is this, you know, way of like making a community central, not just like, oh, it's nice to have some fans or it's nice to have some, it's, it's making the community really one in the same with how this protocol gets powered, how it gets governed, how it gets funded. And, you know, and so like, 
I think the th you know, some of the things to look towards are, you know, is like, you know, better mechanisms for DAOs, better mechanisms for governance. Um, one of the things that really held Ethereum back is the fact that it's extremely difficult just to do a safe multi-sig. You know, that you're, you're having to use other smart contracts just to work with a smart contract in multi-sig. So like, this is an example of a fundamental thing that Cadeno offers is the PAC smart contract language is makes it that a programmer, anytime a programmer wants to use a public key, they have to use a public key set and they can't distinguish between the two. So in other words, it's up to the user. The user decides what kind of security, the programmer does not decide. The user decides what kind of security they want to have. They want to have a 10 way key set. It's as easy as a single way key set, you know, like, and this is, and, you know, and a lot of the most exciting work in Cadena right now is in tooling because Cadena is, you know, one of the things we say about Cadena is that our users live in the future because Cadena is already a multi-blockchain system because that's how we scale. So we already have, you know, parallel horizontal scaling across chains that is identical to what it looks like when two different protocols talk to each other. But what that means is that you have to like the tools have to really take a level up so that they can really offer to, they can offer a metaphor to the user so that, for instance, your KDA right now, you know, when you first started using Cadena, you had KDA and chain one, you had KDA and chain three, you had KDA and chain eight, you had KDA and chain 12. And now someone on chain four wants you to send them money. Oh my God, now you have to like transfer this over here and transfer this over here. And it was like, and you know, and, and to be frank, it was extremely intimidating for users. But now the wallets that were that, you know, with our, you know, with our grants program and a lot of the stuff that we're funding now are moving people to where the wallet gives you, you know, just a single balance and can just figure out behind the scenes where the money is supposed to go. And it all happens without you having even to think about it. And likewise, that same account, it actually makes it really easy to do something like a multi-sig transaction. Because that's, again, something that can be extremely intimidating for a normal user. But the end state with Cadena products is, I mean, one of the most useful things for multi-sig is not doing a kind of, you know, classic, like, uh, what, what did you call that exchange owned? Uh, Lilana. <laughs> right. Where, you know, maybe the same person owns all five keys in the key set, right? <laughs> in the multi-sig. So... Now, that's derided as like, you know, bad governance, which it is. But meanwhile, that is excellent uh, custody security to, you know, so like, say you've got a big bag, right? Well, wouldn't it be nice if you had three keys on that bag where you where you, you need two and one of them's your phone, one of them's your smartwatch, one of them, you know, secure enclaves on those, one of them is your computer, and another one's like a piece of paper sitting in a safe deposit box, like... You can never lose your crypto in that circumstance. And so these are the kind of things that like are, these are the fundamental advances that have to happen for, because, you know, DeFi kind of made things so wild that, and also just raised the level of economic risk to make it that you really had to be a degen. You really had to be like YOLO, you know, I, you know, I don't want to be poor. I'm going to go into these protocols because that's how you do it. But crypto was already very intimidating for your average user because just the sheer fear. And it's one of the reasons why centralization is still so prominent is that most people don't want to hold their keys. Most people don't want to bust out a ledger. Most people, you know, they're afraid of it because then, you know, and it's frankly, it's not great security because like you could lose your ledger and then game over. It's gone forever. Whereas like as long as Coinbase is around, you can keep your crypto on Coinbase and, you know, oh, I hope Coinbase stays around. It's looking a little shaky these days. Um, sorry, I had to throw that in there. Um, <laughs> so so these are the kinds of fundamental, like... We're still hiring, by the way. No we're problem. still hiring. Yeah, no problem. No problem with, at OK Coin. It's still going yeah. strong. Yeah, no, I mean, this is... And, you know, and that's another thing. That's also, I think, why, you know, the, it's it's... We're not an ounce less bullish about crypto at Cadena because, um, you know, these are the kind of inflection points where you start kind of focusing more on fundamentals and the projects that are really offering something different. And there are high quality DeFi projects. I mean, I don't think Uniswap is going anywhere. 
they may not have quite the, you know, remember Uniswap didn't have until Uni came along, it didn't even have yield and it was doing great. So, um, and that's an example that's, and that's kind of what I'm talking about. That's like, to me, that's the real, and that's why I'm also really bullish on layer ones. And that's why it's so important to have a scalable layer one. And that's what Cadena is, you know, and, and I am really interested in the macro discussion. So I'm doing a terrible job selling Cadena, but like, you know, that's one of the things Cadena really did is Cadena is actually the only horizontally scalable layer one. Every other layer one is not horizontal. It's always some kind of hierarchy. And there's always a drop in security when you go. From, so like whether that's subnets on Avalanche, uh, you know, uh, whatever they call them on Polkadot, any of these, uh, you know, like, uh, I mean, Cosmos is a little different because the Cosmos- Parachains chains on Polkadot. Parachains chains on Polkadot. Cosmos is a little different because those are just truly independent. Like if anything, Cadena today is what like Cosmos will be like when IBC is ubiquitous. And this, but, um, well, still not totally the same because KDA is the, is the platform token overall of Cadena. Um, so the point being is that, and what's more is that Cadena, unlike any of the other protocols can scale essentially forever. Cadena it launched with 10 chains, which made it 10 times faster than Ethereum. I mean, actually faster, but like, you know, that's kind of the order of magnitude. We scaled to 20 chains a year later. So again, doubling throughput. And that and remember throughput is how many transactions. So like, this is something that's important to talk about with proof of work chains is that people confuse speed of transactions with throughput. And the reason why it's important to understand that is because Bitcoin, which is the slowest of them all, if Bitcoin didn't slow down when everybody rushes to Bitcoin, no one would care that it takes an hour. If it always took an hour, everybody would be happy with Bitcoin. And in fact, we'd be doing all of everything we're talking about today on Bitcoin, because if it could scale, then, you know, it really doesn't matter if it takes an hour, because let's face it, Visa and MasterCard takes 30 days. Checks take God knows how long. The stock market takes three days to settle. Bitcoin is the fast, you know, compared to them, Bitcoin is lightning fast. So that's, so the two things that, that Cadena has focused on from the start is scalability and security. And by bringing both, and security, by security we mean safety, but we also mean things like multi-sig. By bringing both of those to the market, those are critical things for adoption because even scalability is bad for security and adoption because everybody knows one of the worst things about Ethereum is the gas prices and the gas prices are high because Ethereum can't scale. And so how do you, proof how of do stake you... chains have the same problem because even if they run faster, they still hit the upper limit and then the gas goes through the roof. How do you control for that on Cadena? Inevitably, right? As more, more and more people use the, 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 um, the layer, layer one by right, the protocol and the token value goes up because it's speculation for the usage and you get actual fees accruing down to the token. How do you, how do you control for the fact that, Hey, if I have to pay for point, whatever, let's call it point one, one KDA for a transaction now, which is worth, and we're making a fake currency here, which is $1 now, but one KDA in five years can be worth a hundred dollars now paying a hundred bucks for a transaction. How do you control for that on your scale? Um, well, one is that, um, there's, uh, I mean, it's, it's actually a really weird thing about Ethereum that it never had a mechanism to kind of scale down gas prices when ETH shot through the roof. Like that seems like, you know, but, but one reason why is because that's not fundamental to the blockchain. That's basically organization amongst miners, but that's something that you can control for. But fundamentally the reason why, so in the end, the reason why the price shoots to the roof is not because of the price of the token, because that does eventually kind of settle down. Like. Ethereum at two thousand dollars does not mean that it costs two thousand that it costs two hundred times as much to do a transaction as when Ethereum was at a hundred dollars. And in fact, the times when it's most expensive is when everybody's using Ethereum because that's and so that correlation with Ethereum's price is not uh, is not uh, robust. It's strictly usage and utilization that drives up the gas price. And so Cadena, as I said, we scaled to 20 chains and that, that was basically the hard part because we had to show 
that the algorithm could in, you know, online, we didn't shut down the network, go from 10 to 20 chains. Now that we've established that, the fundamental, the, the graph theory fundamentals that power Cadenas protocol allow us to go to 50 chains, 100 chains, 1,000 chains, 10,000 chains, 100,000 chains. There's actually no limit. Uh, they're all, it's, it's this funny thing called the degree diameter problem. These known solutions to an NP complete problem, but these solutions are known into the millions. So now the only thing is once you're running like a million chains, that's going to use up an awful lot of bandwidth. So like there are other limits on how much we can scale, but the f algorithm itself scales limitlessly. And the weirdest thing about that is the amount of hash rate you need to power 20 chains when it goes to 50 chains is the same. It gets uniformly distributed. And then the really crazy thing is the network gets more secure, not less. So Cadena, that is one of the fundamental ways. So if Bitcoin had had this, we would not be having any of these debates today about Bitcoin's energy usage because it would be delivering so much utility. And in such, and you know, like you'd basically be able, we'd be running the entire world on Bitcoin now. That's Cadena's vision. That's a pretty big vision. I like it. Um, so I have uh, one one question. It's kind of two parts, and I think it will help um, help the listeners here get a better feel or, or uh, understanding of why Cadena might be the place for them to to peruse around and, and learn more about. But um, I know that you guys are doing some cool stuff related to DeFi. Could you just explain a little bit how you're innovating uh, within that sector? And then secondarily, for as it relates to DeFi innovation or or innovation otherwise, um, where should someone go to explore and learn a little bit more about Cadena? Well, I'll answer the second question first. You can go to cadena.io. Uh, you can also join our Telegram or our Discord. You can find all those on cadena.io. Uh, you can follow me and the project and all, all the other smart people in Cadena on Twitter. Um, and we're always doing... We, everything we're doing in uh, ecosystem development is called Cadena Eco, and you can follow that on Twitter. Um, and that's, and, you know, and, and we really want, the, especially, you know, like, uh, we really love people coming on the Telegram and the Discord and the Twitter and, and really asking questions and contributing and most, and most of all, builders. Like, we're really excited about PACT. We're making huge investments in, in making PACT the best language to write dApps in and having the best kind of, uh, you know, JavaScript set up for doing that so that people can really get to market really quickly. Um, and then finally, we're doing um, a lot, you know, our main focus right now is on, we launched a grants program in uh, April. That was 10, that was 100 million for grants. We actually uh, carved off a bit of that for projects that were affected by the Terra debacle. And, you know, we'll see what happens with Celsius, but, you know, we definitely want to help out people who, you know, who their funding might have been cut or something like that. Um, and what's more, they were, you know, when the first uh, grantees announcement comes out and one I can tease, uh, I can tease a couple. And one of them is a company called Lago Finance that is going to really be offering a, an integrated suite of DeFi protocols, but that are going to take advantage of all the things that Cadena has to offer. Um, this includes things like, um, <clears throat> once you get to, since Cadena is scalable, you can overcome a lot of the issues that happen, uh, within DeFi, such as, um, MEV and some of the kind of predatory trading you see. One of the reasons why it's so hard to avoid MEV on Ethereum or an unscalable chain is that when gas is so high, the last thing you want to do is break your trade into five trades and pay gas five times. But that's the fundamental technique of better trading is trade less and have a, you know, my background is algorithmic trading. This, you know, the secret sauce of algorithmic trading is don't let people know what you're trading. That's the whole point is like you break it up into small and random bits and you kind of, you know, come out at random times and you do various things. You, you monitor your market impact as you go. These are the kind of things that DeFi, that the next generation of DeFi on Cadena will offer is you know finally bringing some of these modern techniques for controlling price impact and you know all these kinds of things because guess what mevs just like hedge funds like it's no less dangerous trading in the stock market 
It's just that it's a bigger market and there's it's got and it's a little bit more scalable than crypto. And so that's what that's our goal. Our goal is to take on the stock market and we already can settle the stock market on our 20 chains today. We could settle every trade on the New York Stock Exchange today on Kineta. We got to get you. We want to get settled, not trade. So <laughs> important distinction. Um, that's what, but we want to get to that point where like, you know, when you go to trade, you basically, you give a price and you give kind of an aggressiveness quotient and then it goes out and gets it done for you. And at that point, MEV, you know, is, is frankly, it's what all the hedge funds like to say, they're providing liquidity because if they're at that point, if MEV is just giving you a little bit of arbitrage, you know, it's fine because in, at the end of the day, you want to get into your position. But right now, MEV can completely destroy you because you're you're taking your whole trade to market. So listen, this has been this has been great. We want to start wrapping with a, a little segment called OK, Not OK. This is the the whole conversation up to now was the appetizer. This is the main dish here. Okay? <laughs> so this is the real hot seat. So we'll give you some things. You just tell us, okay, or not okay. Okay? Here we go. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Start off with something easy. Dipping cookies into tea. Okay or not okay? It's okay if it's biscotti. Oh, okay. That's good. Uh, investing in Mulana. Okay or not okay? <laughs> uh, it's okay today. <laughs> it's, it's okay today. Okay. Uh Proof of stake, okay or not okay? Not okay. <laughs> I love it. All right, Harrison, br br bring it home in the real bangers. Okay, Stuart, putting citrus fruit, particularly lime or lemon, in your guacamole. Well, lime is an ingredient in guacamole. Not in my guacamole. <laughs> Harrison well, is not okay in this one. Right, right. Yeah, so you already answered. Not okay. For myself, I was. I wanted to hear your thoughts. Um, what about Elon well, I, Musk? I think you put too much lime in, and it's pretty, and it's nasty. Okay. Uh, okay. What about Elon Musk making all of his staffers go back to work and then firing ten percent of them? Fuck that guy. Wow. <laughs> strong, strong opinion. Um, and then, <clears throat> lastly. This market. This market. <laughs> Not no, I, it's really, I, I, you know, it's like, it's this kind of thing, like people really, you know, it's like, I, you know, I, I, I think that's another thing I really hope to see come out of this is that like people need to start, there is, you can implement controls in crypto. There's no reason why you can't. You can do things to make it that like, you can't just shut down withdrawals. You, you know, you can, you can design protocols to handle the inevitable and no one did it. And, you know, and if, and if crypto gets regulated out of existence in that sense, it's going to be its own fault because there's a lot of lessons to be learned from self-regulating organizations and things like that. So yeah, I'm thumbs down on this market because, you know, some people got hurt. Hopefully this is all part of the creative, you know, creative kind of destruction, creative atrophy. It's a shame that Biden's, executive order is not hasn't come yet and there's definitely gonna be a lot of scrutiny if celsius can't dig themselves out I, you know and there's there are rumors that you know it's sbf and others that are hunting kind of it's whale hunting you know eight, everyone trying to liquidate each other we'll wrap after this but that's a shame because it's short-term gain somebody's making lots of money for the long-term health of the industry and you know celsius their risk their risk mitigation strategies just were not up to par were not up to par, right? And so people chase these yields without understanding the risk. And we, everyone, me included, kind of expected Celsius to do a little bit of a better job given the pedigree and the, and the track record. Uh, and I think- Let's also not be that. too hard on crypto. Let's not forget the 2008 <laughs> financial crisis, which was, yep. which by the way, meaningful regulation did not show up for that. And exactly. we, we face a lot of those risks still today. We do. So I think crypto, you know, has a chance to learn from its mistakes and lead. And that's what it should do. Totally agree. With that, thank you so much for coming. This is one uh, one of my favorite conversations for sure. Uh, we got to have you back on, especially as you guys scale and um, and, uh, and and develop. Maybe we'll have you on every every few months or so. We can.
go deep into protocols, consensus algorithms. I mean, who knows who's going to blow up next time we're going to come up, you know, maybe which, which other L1 is going to, is going to poop the bed, if you will, for all the uh, young audiences out there. We'll keep it PG, <laughs> but we'd love to have you back on. Stuart, thank you so much. Where can people follow you when you said on Twitter? What's your Twitter handle? I'm Sir Lens a lot. Lens, like camera lens, Sir Lens a lot on Twitter. Love it. Sir Lens a lot on Twitter. And uh, and guys, go check out Kadena, do your own research. Um, but, you know, definitely okay in our book. We don't list things that we don't uh, necessarily believe in. So thanks again. Really happy to have you. Thank you. you. Fantastic. Thanks, Stuart. Bye.